Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Files. Hello, my name is Dirt the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast, where we talk bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. I'm coming live from my den here in the northwest of England. This is the second part of episode 47, which was all about Call of Cthulhu. It puts in all the bits that didn't quite fit into the first one. It's not a sequel, it's a stretch goal that you didn't really need, but you got it anyway. Since the last podcast, I'm pleased to say that the hard copy of Children of Fear has arrived. I know I was effusive last time about the campaign, but I genuinely believe that it has a tremendous sense of place and adventure, and it's up there with some of the best Call of Cthulhu campaigns that have been produced over the past 40 years. I've been busily scrawling on it, underlining the important stuff, perfecting my James Mason NPC accent for Professor Wang, and we've been creating player characters suitable for the epic journey across the Silk Roads. Really looking forward to running it and getting into the richly drawn landscape. KSM have produced a series of short blogs on the how to prepare for Children of Fear, written by the author of the campaign, Lynn Hardy. At the moment, I'm totally stuck together with post-it notes. We're very excited to have Lynn back, and she faces the Keeper's screen, hiding her arcane secrets that are drawn out only by the means of a table that I roll on, apparently at random. Judge Blythe, our resident rules lawyer, joins me in the Zoom of role-playing rambling to roll on his library use, to look at a different Worlds magazine, issue number 9 from February 1982, a Call of Cthulhu special, that comes at us, in the words of Sandy Peterson, with a horrible squishing noise, like a giant wearing wet tennis shoes. Also in this part, we have the return of the post bag, selected highlights of listener feedback about the previous part. In the I'll Get Me Coat section, We talk about when we went on a caravan holiday to Morecambe, a seaside town in the northwest, Blackpool's car park, which was a faded shadow of its former glory years back in the 80s, never mind now. I thought that it was a time when we did some horror gaming, but we never actually got round to it, so forgive us for this hoary old tale about nothing in particular. I'll be back at the end with the usual parish notices. Until then... Ramblers, let's get rambling. Games Master Screen. Welcome back to the Zoom of Role Playing Rambling. And I'm going to put this keeper screen in front of the two of us so I can hide my secrets. And I've got a table here, Lynn, mm-hmm. um, that has got random elements from your life. And I'm going to use that percentile dice, obviously. <laughs> I should think so too. Yeah. I'm going to roll on here, apparently at random, and uh, pick out. <laughs> Is that why it's behind the screen? Because it's not even vaguely random. <laughs> I cannot reveal my secrets. <laughs> okay. Here goes. <laughs> okay. Okay, we've got uh, number 20. Number 20 is the Dying Earth role-playing game. And I'm a massive Jack Vance fan, so, and I've only ever played it once. So t- tell us about uh, Dying Earth and how you got to be involved in that. Oh, well, this is all fallout from having been in Robin's gaming group when I worked in Toronto. You know, we kept in touch with what he was working on. We kept playtesting things that he was doing with Palgrain. Um, I knew the people at Palgrain because we used to go down to Dragon Meet every year to sort of see Robin and, and get to talk to people. Uh, so we ended up playtesting the Dying Earth role-playing game. Uh, they were also putting out the, this magazine uh, called The Excellent Prismatic Spray for it. And it was one of those things where I hadn't actually read any Vance at that point. Um, it was one of the ones that I just completely managed to, I was aware of him, but I never got around to reading any. Uh, so, you know, volunteered to play test it, I got the books, read them, was really surprised by 
how different they were you know they, they were very sort of different to the sort of fantasy that I'd been exposed to through other forms of gaming and so it was it was fascinating we had an absolute blast play testing it it was total you know the characters were a total disaster nothing ever went right for them but it was brilliantly entertaining and just a huge amount of fun so I ended up writing lots of articles and bits and bobs for the excellent prismatic spray and um you know pieces for various of the other sort of source books for for dying earth and then ended up writing um fields of silver which was my first published campaign is that still available fields of silver i think you might be able to get the pdf but no print versions go for well allegedly go for stupid prices on ebay and things people attempt to sell them for stupid prices um i'm not sure what the state of the license between palgrain and the and the the, the vance uh, estate is at the moment i know they did get a renewal at one point so i i'm not entirely certain it might be for those people who are not familiar with it, it it's a very unusual game isn't it because it is a game of twists and turns in conversation i suppose it's it's yeah. it, it's bedded in that larp um free form approach isn't it yeah yeah, I think that's probably one of the reasons why we, we enjoyed it so much, because it is, it's um, obviously it's the dying earth, the earth is dying, it's the end of days, and it's just this, it's the stories of these real, really colourful characters trying to eke out their existence against this decadent, dying civilization, basically, with all these hideous monsters that just keep trying to eat you, um, <laughs> but in amusing ways. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a great deal of fun. I'm very fond of that game. Well, let's go on to the uh, next uh, thing on the table. Let's uh, see what we get this time. This is 84, and this is Cogs, Cakes, and Sword Sticks. So I know out there are my listeners. There's some big fans of this out there. So it, for those people who don't know, <laughs> uh, for those people who don't know uh, what Cogs, Cakes, and Sword Sticks is, what, what, how, how, how do you explain it to new players? It's a game of pulp steampunk adventure in the Empire of Steam. And and so what do you play in, in, in there? What's, what will the play characters do? Well, you're heroes. Um, so, you know, the, the system is unabashedly weighted in your favour because, yeah, you're heroes. You know, you are there to have big, bold adventures in a steampunk universe. So you go off and you... You solve problems. You you go and like, fight your your nemeses with your big steam mechas or whatever gadgets you've got in your airships. However, you've had to, as long as you come home for key, uh, uh, tea and cake afterwards, of course. What mechanics does it use? Is, is it a dice based uh, game? I've it never is. I'm it. just I'm just going to turn away very briefly from the camera because I've got my dice bag back here and I can't remember whether she's in here or not. Let me see if she is. Oh, she is. So. Use a D6, and this is Big Red. And those of you who have played the game at conventions know Big Red. Um, she was actually named by a player, and she matches the colour of the cover, which is why I got her in the first place. So you have a D6. You have three statistics, which are the name of the game. So you have cogs, which are your thinking and technical skills, cakes, which are your social skills, and sword sticks, which are your physical skills. So it might be fighting, but it could be sport, could be dancing could be we had one very kick-ass ballerina librarian at one point she was awesome basically you tell me what you want to do i set a difficulty there is one table in the game it is about yay big which is the difficulty levels you roll a d6 and add your skill bonus because one thing you're the best at you know so you get a plus three in that the others you get a plus two so the chances are you are most likely to succeed but it's it's got a we see where where is it so if you get a six critical success basically best outcome plus wonderful you enhance your reputation dramatically and of course then there's the one which is the critical failure you you can't get out of that uh, and this one she knows when it is dramatically appropriate in the story to roll a one we did build in a system uh, called reputation so you had reputation points you got a reputation point if you rolled a d6 because you'd you'd perform so spectacularly you had enhanced your reputation in your field if you rolled a one, you could spend a reputation point before disaster struck to go. But surely someone with my reputation wouldn't do something quite that stupid. And you could re-roll the dice. But she knows, and quite often she would then roll a one again, and you could only attempt to buy it off once. So 
Yeah, so it was literally the gentleman who named this. He never rolled anything but ones the entire game. He was crying with laughter by the end of it. To the point, and he was he was a barber surgeon on a flying steamship to the point that they actually started using him as a weapon. Uh, if anybody <laughs> wouldn't do what they wanted them to do, they would threaten to set the barber surgeon on them just to treat their wounds. <laughs> Um, so that it was, yeah. So that's that's where the little legend of Big Red comes from because she was she was very dramatically appropriate in that game and has continued to be so ever since. It, it sounds like a really fun game, and I know people who played it have said uh, that it is. You can get some really good uh, adventures out of it. Well, it, was, it was designed because we'd um, part of the offshoot of of doing the Victorian LARP was when steampunk started to get big uh, in Britain. We had friends who, who'd run the Victorian LARP for us, were, were getting into steampunk as, as sort of like a, an adjunct aesthetic. And the uh, it was it was an event called the Asylum, which started in Lincoln many, many moons ago. And the reason it was called that was because it was actually run in the buildings that had been Lincoln Asylum, uh, although it was by that point a wedding venue. Um, <laughs> it's like the bizarrest thing in the world. Um and we went there the first year and it was great. And we heard people talking how they wanted to do role playing, but they weren't quite sure where to start. And of course, you had at that point, you had Victoriana, which is a great game. Um, I helped edit the third edition. So, you know, that was fantastic. And there was Airship Pirates and they are good games, but they're not the game I would give to someone who's never gamed before because they're slightly intimidating. So I wanted to create a game it would be nice and simple and straightforward that people who liked cosplay could get into and it wouldn't take a huge amount of equipment it wouldn't you know you wouldn't need to be lugging big books around with you anywhere uh so we went away rich is my sounding board and he helped me with the mechanics and everything and we went with a d6 because it's a dice that most people are familiar with and you can get hold of reasonably easily you don't have to go to a specialist shop to get it necessarily and we just wanted something that was really accessible and really simple to pick up and play that would sort of allow you to create stories without having to worry about a huge amount of mechanics. And the whole gag was originally that all you needed was a napkin to write your character on and a sugar cube to draw the pips on to use as a dice. And then we discovered that most British sugar cubes aren't cube shaped anymore. So that kind of went out the window. And one of the things we used to do when we first would, were, were doing the game was before a comp, before the asylum, usually, we would go and buy bags of cola cubes. And I we used to have um, a cake place uh, down the road that had food colouring safe pens. And we used to sit and draw the dots on the cola cubes before the convention um, sort of like and use them in the games and, and sort of like let people take them away. Uh, so... <laughs> That's said right. it was that was the whole idea for for originally that you know you needed no equipment other than a sugar cube and and a napkin and and tea is a very important part of your life if anybody <laughs> follows your twitter timeline i did have a day where every time you put the kettle on i did as like a <laughs> a lynn hardy drinking game every time lynn mentions tea or gin <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's go back to the table <laughs> Okay, I've rolled uh, a zero one, a zero one. Ooh, so that's critical. It is a but critical. That ten, takes me to a nested table, which I need to roll a d ten, which is a ten. And this seems like it. It's redacted, and there's some kind of <laughs> secrets here. This must be Rivers of London. This is the. Ooh. This is the, uh, the the project you're working on at the moment, isn't it? It is. Yes. Amongst many other things, uh, one of the one of the joys of working on on multiple game lines is that you never get the chance to just concentrate on one thing. You have to spread yourself across all of them. So it's like, which hat am I wearing today? So, so Rivers of London is a, probably the first time that Chaos Team have done a, an IP tie-in for quite some time, isn't it? So it is it, for quite some time, yeah. 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 So what stage is it, is it at the moment? And uh, it, for, for people who don't know, what, what, what is the project? Rivers of London is a role-playing game based on Ben Aronovich's urban fantasy Rivers of London series. Uh, mm. So it's um, the adventures of, well, the books are the adventures of Peter Grant and the Folly, which is basically the magical branch of the Metropolitan Police Force. 
So it's currently out in uh, round two playtesting at the moment. It went out a couple of weeks ago. He said this is what's the nerve wracking bit is like letting it out into the wild so for, for gaming groups to have a good go at it and, and see what we have and haven't missed, what we need to clarify, if there's any changes we need to make, any little tweaks, you know, that sort of thing. And what's been the uh, most significant challenge of uh, the project? Creating a system that is BRP based allows you to play and evoke um, the atmosphere of Ben's novels. Because yeah, magic's a big part of that, isn't it? Creating that atmosphere yeah, is, is really difficult in a game, isn't it? And particularly, it's a way of breaking the mechanics, isn't it, uh, magic? It and, is, yeah. And yeah. it's how, how to do that in a controlled yet authentic way is, is always a challenge. So, Yeah, and there were a couple of routes we could have gone. I mean, Ben is a, is a gamer. Um, which means he's been great to work with because he understands how gaming works. But there were two ways we could go. Obviously, the way it's described in the book, it has a very Ars Magica feel to it, where you plomp Latin terms together to create effects. Now, that's a great system, and it's very, very versatile, but we really wanted Rivers of London to be more of an introductory game. Because obviously what we're hoping is that people who are fans of the books will see the game and want to give it a try. So that, the Ars Magica type system of where you have a Latin term and another Latin term and then you bang them together and you create your own effect, that's actually really intimidating for someone who's not into gaming or even for people who've been doing it for a long time because that, you know, having to do that on the fly is, is it can be quite tricky. So we've, we've kind of gone the other way for that. We, we have sort of, we've got a spell list basically. <laughs> Uh, that uses the spell names in the book and we've and you know we've talked with ben numerous times about what the levels of them are and to to sort of like classify all of that just because while it's it's it doesn't have the flexibility that that sort of like taking words and adding them together system would have it's more accessible which is the key thing for this game and he's even written a note for us to go in the book saying yeah we know this isn't exactly how it works in the books but you know you, it, that would be nigh on impossible to do in, in, a, in a role-playing game so it's great because he keeps writing his really good asides that we can, <laughs> that we can put in there <laughs> yeah and it is intimidating as well isn't it for new players to um, have to come up with a free form results of uh, spells and I think yeah. you're quite right for new players to have a shopping list to choose from and that also generates the setting as well, doesn't it? The yeah. magic list generates the setting. So, yeah, I think it's the right way to go. You get a thumbs up from me on that. Thank you. <laughs> the thing that's generally coming uh, back from playtest, the first round playtest and the second round playtest, is that people are having a huge amount of fun with it, which at the end of the day is the main goal. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I'm not going to ask you for a date. So there you go. Please don't. <laughs> don't jinx it. No, I have a I have a date in my head that I'm aiming for. I am well aware, having been in the gaming industry for as long as I have been, that the chances of making that <laughs> eeny tiny. <laughs> yeah, I've, I'm not going to ask. Okay, don't. let's 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 roll again. Okay, so oh, a, a straight fifty. Now. That means that I've unleashed the contractual obligation question. When, whenever somebody from KSM comes on, we have to ask the question of what's in the pipeline. What what can we look forward to? Well, more than enough to keep players gaming for at least the next decade, if not longer. Um, <laughs> the pipeline is huge, um, which is one of the reasons why they brought me on, because poor Mike could, was drowning under the weight of projects. <laughs> Now, there's two of us drowning under the weight of projects. Uh, we, we have got a lot to keep you entertained for a huge amount of time. In the immediate future, um, we have various really cool things for the 40th anniversary, which I'm not going to announce because uh, that should really be Mike. Um, but we have a time to harvest coming up, which was originally uh, one of the organised play. Um, that's been updated, revised, uh, and given that the full artworks and everything and um, so that's due to go into layout very soon uh then um there's there's cults of chaos which mike has been working on not cults of chaos no that's the that's the online gaming thing he's been working cults of cthulhu um so that's coming up which is looking at the cthulhu cult and various scenarios for that and then the one i'm mostly working on at the moment um 
is Regency Cthulhu. So that's uh, I'm putting the finishing editing touches to that at the moment. Uh, so hopefully that will be out soon. So that's um, written by Andy Peregrine and me. Uh, and um, so that's we're doing um, final playtesting at the moment, uh, and I'm busy editing it as we go. And that's been a huge amount of fun. That, that that sounds great. So, will it be in a similar format to the other um, variants with background material and some scenarios? It's more of a mini supplement, so it's not going to be as big as Down Darker Trails. It's got um, how to create a Regency character, uh, a town setting uh, with various NPCs and little businesses, and then two scenarios to run you through. So, it's kind of probably going to be something um, around the Sour's Reign of Terror. Uh, so it's you know it's not a, it's not a full on gigantic setting book, but there are there is enough information in there for you to have your own little mini Regency campaign thing going on. That sounds great. Look forward to that. Okay, I'm gonna roll for the last time. Let's see what we uh, what we get this time. Oh, now this is a this is a fumble. This is a oh no. Yeah, so that means that it's not one of my questions. This is uh, this is from a listener. Thank God. This is. <laughs> This is from a Mr. M. Mason of Nottingham. Oh, oh. hang on. <laughs> Why is Jaws the greatest movie ever made? <laughs> I should have known that would be the question, shouldn't I, really? Um, it is a tremendously good movie. I know Mike was utterly horrified when he discovered I'd never actually seen it. Uh, I, it's one of these ones where it was on the telly and I'd always seen bits of it. And you know how sometimes you think you've seen more of a film than you have that way? Um, but it was one of these things we never quite got round to. And we had been due to sort of go down and have like a movie watching weekend at Mike's house um for jaws and alien because I've, I've never managed to get through alien i did try watching it once on my own and got too scared and had to turn it off um so and then of course the pandemic hit so it never happened uh, and he actually sent me a copy of the dvd through the post <laughs> to make sure i watched it and it turned out that i hadn't seen very much of it at all it is a superb film it, it really is beautifully paced the character acting in it is great uh, i understand so many more internet memes now um <laughs> But I, I, best horror film ever made? Oh, I don't know. Or best film ever made? I see. I really don't know. I'm not sure I'm allowed to agree, disagree with him. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a superb film. I, I, in some ways, I envied you that you hadn't actually seen it because we've told the story on the podcast of the chap who loved the film so much he was hypnotised to make him forget that he'd seen it so that he could enjoy the jump scares again and we always joke that maybe he was hypnotized so much that he'd forgotten that he really liked it and never watched it again <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much uh, lynn it's been absolutely wonderful to spend this time with you and uh thanks for thanks for taking the time to speak to us well thank you very much for having me it's been a huge amount of fun oh great thank you thank you take care library use and welcome to the room of a role-playing rambling. It's that time when we peruse something recovered from the attic. Uh, this time we're looking at a very specific issue of uh, different worlds. I've got Blythe with me. Hello, Blythe. Hello, Dirk. Now, before we look at this, I should say that I have gone back in time and I've listened to the second episode of The Grognard Files, which I don't normally do. And it's a long time ago now. We sound very fresh-faced and naive, in a way, about uh, Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> You've been subjecting yourself to that, listening to us back then. But one of the things that I do in that programme is I invite listeners to imagine 40 years ago, go back in time, opening this game, trying to fit it within the, uh, the, the repertoire of games that they were playing at the time, to try and appreciate how different it was to what was available at the time. And I think going back to this issue of uh, different worlds, it is sort of like that, that exercise, isn't it, of understanding how, at the time, KRC were trying to pitch it you know, within the market to try and say what purpose it served. Yeah, it's it's very much like that. This this issue kind of sets what Call of Cthulhu is, doesn't it? 
in terms of there's the Sandy Peterson um, article about him designing it. And then there's the Lynn Willis article, isn't there, about how it was put together and marketed. So, yeah, it's kind of setting the stall out, really. So it was published in uh, February 1982. It's uh, number 19, if you want to follow this at home. So it more or less just been uh, released, um, Call of Cthulhu. I think there'd been some uh, production delays. It had come out in 1981 because this, this year is the 40th anniversary. Later in the year, there's going to be some form of celebration of it. But um, this magazine, uh, as you say, is Sandy Peterson and Lynn Willis pitching the game and just giving some idea of their design thoughts behind the game that they produced. It's quite interesting in places, isn't it? It it does um, show that it was a very considered approach to developing a world within Lovecraft using um, the basic role-playing system. It is. I find one of the best bits in it is the uh, they make the point that H.P. Lovecraft pronounced Cthulhu differently from Cthulhu. He pronounced it um, Tulu or Kulahulu, but he wasn't trying to get gamers to ask for it by names by naming stores, which made me laugh because I think we have so many problems pronouncing things. But it's fine now. Once you read, it's fine. Everyone's pronouncing it different from Lovecraft himself. So you can have your Nathla Teps, your Nalala Teps. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. I, I, might, I might store that for one of the conventions. I said, well, in actual fact, what you'll find is H.P. Lovecraft pronounced it very differently. <laughs> Although, how do they know? Yeah. They never met him. How do they know? I don't know. Anyway, there you go. Well, that was re- that's the re- most reassuring piece in the whole article, I think. <laughs> you can say it how you want. Don't worry. In the uh, in in the article, uh, Sandy Peterson does work through some of the I suppose the debates that we've been having ever since of where does the tone sit? Like we were saying last time, you know, this is a game that you can scale and uh, set with different levels of um, confrontation or investigation or exploration this is the scale the scope of it is what excited him you know that you could lock horns with al capone or meet albert einstein but by the same token you know it could be a, an adventure much like raiders of the lost ark or you could face the evil cthulhu and his minions and prevent it from destroying the world the actual scope of it is what motivated him to uh, write the game and it's it's interesting that that idea is there right at the beginning, isn't it? Often it's the opposite way with games, isn't it? So you look at D and D, and the scope of D and D starts very kind of go down a dungeon and fight, kill things and find treasure, and then players broaden it out, don't they? And that's often how games work. They're, they're often quite narrow and then broad, broaden out. Whereas it's the opposite with Cthulhu, and it's interesting to see that that was there right at the beginning, that idea of the scope of it, because you tempt you tempted to think that came later. And I suppose it did come later in, in a much more more scenarios and campaigns broadened it out. It, interesting that right at the beginning, he's got this idea that it's got this scope. Quite a kind of perceptive thing, really, isn't it? The, ve- the very thing that's led it to be such a popular game. What I do find interesting is the way that he is helping potential keepers, how they can construct scenarios. There's some of the element of this within the game itself, but I don't think to the same degree that he's doing here in making suggestions of uh, looking at specific films. In fact, you could take a horror story or a a weird fiction story, change the names and uh, deliver deliver it as a a scenario. He says here, popular novels are a good source of scenario ideas. Many of those are also in movie form, but the books usually give better details. An advantage here is that some players will not have read the book but they may have seen the movie. And uh, he goes on to use uh, Salem's Lot as a potential source of the uh, of a scenario. And uh, that's something that you've done recently, isn't it? Or experienced, at yeah, least. Yeah, well, a friend of mine, yeah, a friend of mine ran, ran a Hound of the Baskervilles Cthulhu. And, of course, I'd, I'd only seen the Basil Rathbone film. Um, I've not, never read the actual story. Even then, it was a long time ago, so I'd forgotten lots of it. And that worked quite well because you didn't 
didn't, I kind of knew the, I, I knew the plot. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to some extent, but I didn't know some of the details of the plot. What point did you realise that it was the Hound of the Baskervilles? Because presumably when you went into it, you didn't pitch it as this is a Hound of the Baskervilles story. Well, I think I knew it was Hound of the Baskervilles when we went to Baskerville Hall. <laughs> that was a bit of a giveaway. It says here you should change the no, name. No, he didn't, he didn't dress it up. So it was Hound of the Baskervilles. And of course, I then realised I could get on Wikipedia, but I didn't. I did, but because he did, he did give it a he did give it a, a Cthulhu twist at the, the the end. The actual hound was a was a hound of Tinderless with some fluorescent it paint to end its mane. Quite good, quite good fun though. Quite good fun to do it, you know, to play Sherlock Holmes and Watson. It was quite, it was quite good fun to do it. And I suppose again, it's it's testament to the flexibility of the game, isn't it? That you can do something like that with with that game, set it in you know the eighteen nineties, and get away with it really. Rel- relatively easily, you know, that doesn't take a lot to to do that. At the end of it, Sandy Peterson asks you to uh, write in with a stamped addressed envelope. If you like the game, have any questions or comments, suggestions or additions, please feel free to write to me, care of KLCM or this magazine. If you enclose a self addressed stamped envelope, I'll be sure to reply. If you don't, I may anyway if your letter is especially flattering, stroke interesting, stroke useful, stroke <laughs> annoying. <laughs> there you go. Those are the days. <laughs> yeah. If we'd have, if we'd have read that back in the day, we'd have been talking, think, trying to work out how the international reply coupons work and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, it's an interesting article because it does try and ground this game, give players something to uh, work with. And it's in, it's interesting as well when you compare it to the review of because there is a review of Call of Cthulhu in this issue of different worlds isn't there yeah yeah um and the review is quite it, it's a positive review but the reviewer makes the point about he, he likes to play a character that he can develop over time and you you doesn't think you can do that in Call of Cthulhu which he thinks might be frustrating and he, there's a line in it where he says something about maybe it's because I like to have at least a chance of winning, you might find it a bit frustrating as a game. And I think the two, the, the Sandy Peterson article and that review are interesting to compare because the review is very much a, a player's perspective on it, reading it as a player and yeah, th- looking at it and thinking, oh, this is different because uh, my characters might die quite a lot in it. Whereas yeah. what Sandy Peterson's trying to do is perhaps ground it and make it appealing Maybe with an awareness that it is different yes. and yeah. a, an ang- anxiety maybe that people will react to it in the wrong way because it does fly in the face of what at the time most role-playing games were about. And the review, the, it's interesting to read. I mean, it's, a, it's a good review. He, he, he heaps praise on it, but he does have the reviewer does have that reservation about it, it you know high mortality rate not being able to develop your character not being able to beat the monsters those kind of things reading the review and having listened to a, the second episode that we recorded what five years ago over five years ago uh, you realize that some of the things that we were naively pointing out from uh, our experience of playing call of cthulhu the reviewer was picking up as well so things like firearms are useless mm. uh, in this game. Also pointing out that, well, th- this is interesting. <laughs> this is interesting because this is where you've changed. You've changed just by it. Because in that second episode, you said one of the things that you liked <laughs> about Call of Cthulhu is the range of skills that were available and, you know, that it covered <laughs> the yeah. whole gamut of possibility. You, f- you feel differently now, don't you? No, I hate that. <laughs> I hate that about it. Disappointed in the seventh edition, didn't rationalise the skills. I find it really frustrating that, you know, it's got list and spot hidden. Can you just have a perception? You know, climb and jump. If you're a brilliant climber, you'd be good at jumping. It just stops splitting the skills down too much. I think we've talked about this before. I just I find it really frustrating. There's yeah. too too many skills. But the reviewer here, doesn't he, points out that. What's the utility of a skill like singing? <laughs> well, I think Sandy Peterson makes a point as well, interesting point about the skills, where he does he does concede that the academic skills are broken down into different categories, but he, he accepts that, you know, he's just decided operate heavy machinery is just one skill, even though 
actually operating different types of machinery would be a multitude of skills in reality, wouldn't it? But that, but he just sort of says that's because in his mind, uh, Cthulhu player characters would be more academic than people who would use machines. So, you know, the skill the skill sets are broken down into anthropology and history and all that kind of thing. That in itself is kind of strange. Where do you once you start breaking skills down? Where do you stop? I mean, I've created a character for our children of fear and then he's a he's a professor of history and he's got a 90 percent in history and next to nothing in archaeology the historian we just know what archaeology is where do all yeah. these things come from well, they come from the ground what are you talking about that yeah. skill split it's just just daft that comes from us playing different games i suppose of between that intervening period i think it's interesting in this article as well because i remember um way back in episode two uh, big jack brass uh, John Hancock pointed out that there was an article in Sorcerer's Apprentice which explained how to adapt the Cthulhu um, Muthus, as it says in this uh, in this magazine, or uh, Mythos, yeah, Muthus, into the game of. Don't, uh, wor- don't worry, you can, you can pronounce it. We've established. You can. Established. You can pronounce it how you want. Yeah, we 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 insisted on call, we insisted in that second episode of calling it Mathos. I don't know where that came from. Anyway, Mathos, Mathos, yeah, uh, Muthus the game, uh, Tunnels and Trolls, written by Glenn and uh, Philip Raman. The article was well written, but all of it was useless to me, having already progressed most of the areas covered by the article. But there was one part of it, and uh, he acknowledges that he took one part of it was this idea of uh, sanity depletion and the idea that yes. you know, that somehow the game needed to have some way that a character depleted the, the response to the monsters, et cetera, would, uh, would mean that by the end of it, you could go permanently insane. And it seems that they play-tested this idea, realised that at the level that he was uh, suggesting it actually worked out quite depressing because it just went down and down and down. And uh, although it matched the mood perfectly, it wasn't that fun in play. Uh, yeah. KSEM interjected, I think we said this in the second episode, that KSEM actually interjected and said, well, you know, maybe people can start feeling a bit better as they get through <laughs> this. Yeah, they, they defeat something you've got, yeah. yeah. I suppose it comes back to that, that the, like the reviewer says, the idea that a lot of gamers like the idea, although people say you can't win a role-playing game, they like the idea of winning something, some kind of reward at the end of it, some kind of, you know, get something out of it. So he says the whole concept of sanity permeates the game and makes it what it is. It allows for such things as the case in my own campaign where six players stood inside a pentacle trying to summon the one that walks between the planes and when darkness lowered and the scraping noises were heard, several of the characters hid their eyes so they would not have to see the hideous thing, this hideous being. It's hard to imagine such an event happening in RuneQuest or D and D. That's true, isn't it? it mm. That mechanic alone uh, introduced yes. the idea yeah. of horror. The sanity, yeah, the sanity mechanic changes the way you play the game, doesn't it? Can become a central point of the game as well. As with all these things, it's only been out for a bit, but already they're looking at uh, variants in the magazine, and they actually have <laughs> a suggestion of how you can make. Uh, guns more um i suppose right. g- give a bit more variety a bit more capability i quite like this article uh, just because it's written by someone called dick dick wagonet which is come on that's not a real name i can't be i thought i read it as wage net dick wage net no Wait, like- dick wage net that's even more ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm sorry if you're out there, Dick. I don't mean to mock, but I just it's like a private eyes kind of name, isn't it? Dick Wagonet, <laughs> private detective or something like that. Maybe it is. Anyway, I, I quite like it, that article. I think it's good. I, I like the way it uses something that's kind of in 7th edition now, isn't it? Uh, it has like a rule about shock, doesn't it, from the yes, bullet? yeah. Which I think is really neat, actually. It does a nice thing of... As you know, it's one of my hobby horses. Guns in role playing is one of my hobby horses, isn't it? That you often tell me off for talking about it too much. But it's it's a dilemma of how dangerous can a gun be, and yet the game's still fun. But I like what it does because it, it it makes the the article makes this differentiation. So a a gun, a revolver might do one d eight damage, 
Okay. And, uh, and you think, all right, a sword might do 1d8 damage. But when you're hit with a gun in the, this little rule set, you have to do a roll based on how many hit points you've got left after you've been damaged. And if you fail the roll, you fall unconscious because of the shock of the bullet hitting you. And it's it's quite a neat idea because it, it makes the gun different from other weapons. It actually yeah. brings in something where you think, oh, right, yeah. And, and I suppose now in Cthulhu 7th edition, you've got that major wound thing and rolling under your constitution. So those kind of ideas have been built in there. But it is it's a very good article. I think it's a very neat little rule. And I'm, I'm not one. As you know, you know, back in the day, I was never one for reading rules in magazines and bringing them into the game. But I have to say that this rule, if we were playing, I'd read this yeah. back in the day. I think I've, I'd have brought that rule in. I do think it's a really nifty little rule. You know, not not so nifty nowadays, but back then, it's 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 a very clever way of making guns dangerous, but not too dangerous, but but significant. If you are shot, it's significant significantly different from you hit with a big stick there's quite a good um... never, never, what happened what happened to him i'm sure he had more articles in him dick, <laughs> dick wage net dick wagging out wagging out but he has some suggestions about explosive doesn't he saying that actually mm. the way that explosives is explained in call of cthulhu they have like a cutoff point and nothing happens beyond that whereas in real explosions there's kind of a diminishing impact isn't there yeah it, yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to be, yeah. The, the range isn't like static. It isn't like, yeah, 10d6 damage or whatever within such a range. It will actually, yeah, deplete as it, which you kind of think, yeah, well, we kind of know that. 6d8 damage or something like that if you're within, within 30 feet. And if you're at 31 feet, you take no damage whatsoever, which is ridiculous. Clever little article. There's a couple of things in it that you think, oh, yeah, it would be good to incorporate those. Also including that uh, the errata or second thoughts for Call of Cthulhu. And yes. I want to be at the meeting where some of these were decided. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's like the constitution of uh, some, some monster Sogua. going. From... The Sogua has a con of 100 instead of 120. So the Sogua loses uh, 20 points in that case. But also on the same page, yeah, Gnolak as a con of 100 instead of 120. What What's happened that the constitutions... <laughs> yeah, what's changed? What determined that? Yeah, I'd, I'd just gone up a little bit, really. Not like that much, but I've been bothering him. I had sleepless <laughs> nights over it. Oh, oh, God, God, this, is, this is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. It this it's, not, it's, not, it's not balancing with Yig, this. <laughs> we'll have to do something. Because I guess that's the uh, what an exercise to turn the Lovecraftian monsters into numbers. Yeah, how do you determine it in, in numerical form? Yeah, yeah. So there's some additional um, rules about hit points. Quite rightly, it's saying that actually there should be uh, more hit points for things that are bigger. So you, it's got like an accumulator table that allows you to ascribe more hit points to um, bigger things. Something can be, if something's huge, it's going to take longer to take it down. Page 18. Under law, it actually takes 30 minus int in weeks to learn a foreign nation's laws, not a 30 minus int in months. <laughs> oh, the hell. Campaigns would have been derailed by that error. Who, who, Who's, Whole campaign. who's learning who's learning of foreign nations laws though at what point in the game at what point in the game would that be relevant right we've landed in um i don't know peking which peking. we will be doing in a couple of weeks yeah big, big peking i think we need to learn all the chinese laws in 1923 we need to learn them otherwise we're gonna get nowhere right well it's gonna take <laughs> me so many weeks to do it why? Why are you learning the laws? <laughs> Might come in. You never know, do you? Well, what, at what point? The parking restrictions in Peking or something like that. Oh, I know that. I know them. I spent, I spent <laughs> th what, 30 minutes your intelligence. So what? Even if you've got a good intelligence of 15, you could take 15 weeks. 15 weeks of game time to decide I'm going to spend 15 weeks. Well, we were thinking of going and investigating that mysterious pyramid. No, no, no. Let's not do that yet. Let's not be too hasty. 
let me spend 15 weeks learning the laws of 1920s China, because I'm sure it'll come in. When you're having um, that rickshaw uh, chase in the streets of Peking, yeah. and uh, Shub Nigaroth is chasing it, he's actually got uh, more constitution with these additional rules. He's got more constitution, and Britain, you're aware that the rickshaw man is breaking the low speed limit. Because <laughs> you read that you know the laws. You, what would you say? Slow down, mate. I've about 15 weeks learning the laws here. You're going far too fast on this road. <laughs> One of the things that has featured in uh, in this magazine, and I always love this because you know I'm a big fan of uh, reading old smash hits. And uh, if you read old smash hits, you'd see the poll winners party, you know, how uh, George Michael fared against... Uh, Curiosity mm. killed the cat in uh, 1986. Yeah. Well, there's actually a poll in here, the poll results. Oh, yes. Yeah, there is, isn't there? Yeah. Fascinating answers to fascinating questions. And Why have the, they asked, they, they've asked some, they've asked, haven't they? What's your favourite colour? What well, isn't that not just like a, a wheeze in the office? Oh, let's, uh, let's ask them what the favourite colour is, yeah. And it's blue, um, in case anybody's interested. If I, blue. If I, it's blue, it, blue, isn't it? It's the top one, followed by, I don't know, I can't, I can't remember. Green, okay. green, green, green comes yeah. to close second. And very yeah. shades of red. What's so, your favourite colour? Orange. Orange? You said you said that. If people could see your face, you just said orange. You just said the first thing <laughs> came into your head, didn't you? <laughs> I've known you 40 years. I don't know your favourite colour. And I still don't do that. Because you just you just went orange, yeah, orange. So, in this list, so so list all the role playing games that you play regularly. Not interested in mine? Go on. What what is your favourite colour? Green. Green. Thanks. Right. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and what's what's behind that decision? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just I find it. I got a lot of green jackets. I think maybe that's. That's it. What's behind orange? What's behind orange? Well, yeah. You said orange. You said orange. Don't say what's behind green. What's behind orange? <laughs> well, harder, thing to, harder thing to justify because you just, it's this thing that came into your head. Yeah, it's the first uh, colour I saw. What, um, I suppose at least what we can say is that different world's readers at this particular point in time, their favourite mm. colour was blue yes. and their average age was 22. And, yes. and that That's kind funny. of confirms what we discussed last time about different worlds. Is it actually, it's pitched towards a college audience, isn't it? It's not, unlike uh, White Dwarf that we were reading, which is kind of a school audience, isn't it? That This is definitely going for the college audience. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of interesting because if I think if we'd have read it, at the time, we thought, aren't they old? Aren't they in the readership old? 22. Yeah. So list all of the role-playing games that you play regularly in order from uh, the most to the least. So the votes are AD&D, most popular, Traveller, RuneQuest, The Fantasy Trip, D&D, Chivalry and Sorcery, Gamma World, Space Opera, TNT, Stormbringer. That's interesting, Stormbringer, because that's quite high up and it was only released the year before. Um, then you get Top Secret, Bushido, uh, v- Villains and Vigilantes, uh, Superhero uh, 2044, Boot Hill, Arduin, Aftermath, Gangster, Champions, Thieves Guild, LRS, High Fantasy, Yesgirth. Hell's just, just and stop. entropy. No point now, though, is there? You've got to that <laughs> that level, the, the lower ones. You just, what's this? What does this mean? <laughs> Boot Hill's beaten Thieves Guild. I don't care. <laughs> top three, innit? It's like the Olympics. The same word. Top, top three. That's all we're bothered about. I guess I guess I I, <laughs> I, I list those because it's interesting to see the world that Call of Cthulhu is entering into. Yes, being because, dropped into yeah, 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 dropped into a world of uh, fantasy, uh, superhero fiction, and 
then on the edges some kind of genre stuff like gangsters and cowboys and what's and what's interesting when you see that is going back to what sandy peterson said about its broad appeal in terms of history and monsters and all other things you can see how it would appeal to all those people who played all those games to some extent yeah so if you played boot hill and gangster it would appeal to you as well because it has a historical dimension and if yeah. you played fantasy games, it's going to appeal to you. And if you play science fiction games, it's going to appeal to you because there is an element of science fiction to Cthulhu. So you can see when you look at that list, how this game has been dropped in there and it's going to take people from all those games. They're all going to enjoy it because it inhabits a kind of unique position, doesn't it? Yes. It's yeah. not like any of those other games. And yet at the same time, it has enough qualities that I like those games to grab all those players. Yeah. And that, that's not a deliberate thing. That's not a cynical thing. That's kind of an oh. accidental thing, I suppose. But, but I that's, think that's what's going to happen. Still at this point in 82, which is like eight years since um, role playing really um, started, they're already kind of reframing it, re trying to, trying to find new ways of pitching games. So in this art, in this issue, there is an article for gangster exclamation mm -hmm. mark, um, which has gang leaders. And here um, it's saying um, a gangster published by fantasy games, unlimited plays do not portray wizards, barbarians or spacemen, but lawmen lawbreakers of American criminal history. And um, for one who has read extensively the literature of the depression and prohibition age, lawlessness in this game was made to order. And again, you re you look at this and it's got the characters of John Dillinger, Ma Baker and other criminals from American history. You could use that as a resource for Call of Cthulhu, couldn't you? Which kind yeah. of confirms your point. That. Mm. There's a fantastic um, review as well in this issue. And I think this is this is relevant in a weird way. It's relevant to the, the beginnings of Call of Cthulhu. There's a fantastic review of deities and demigods, the TSR deities and demigods, which absolutely slates it, largely on the basis that it just presents you with a load of statistics for gods as powerful characters or powerful monsters. And it just says it's like a monster manual, but the monsters are just gods. And I'll I'll read the the last paragraph is funny. It's, it's fantastic. I think it's the worst review, like not not the worst, but it's quite good. But but one of the most terrible reviews of a role playing product that I've ever read. And I think the final paragraph really really sums it up, where it says, "The careless butchering of ancient legends, the lack of any details useful for creation of religion in a normal campaign." and the encouragement of the insertion of yet more higher level monsters for the worst kind of fantasy gaming makes deities and demigods fit only for the trash can. Oh. Ouch. That oh. is what I mean. That is, that is bad. But I think it's interesting because what Call of Cthulhu does is, in a way, Call of Cthulhu is like deities and demigods, isn't it? Yeah. That's what the essence it is, isn't it? It is a lot of deities and demigods and gods. But what Call of Cthulhu tries to do is not just make them a load of monsters. It tries to kind of contextualise them, isn't it, in that horror setting and talks about the people who might worship them, the people who might get from them and the spells and summoning them and all these kind of things that in later editions of Cthulhu get, get a little bit more in depth. And it's interesting to read that review that, it's just here's Zeus and he's got 400 hit points and he can do all these things. Leave it. I'll leave it. We'll leave it to you to decide how you use that in your game. Whereas in Call of Cthulhu, you've got Cthulhu, but you've got some kind of setting and context for it that makes it interesting. You kind of with read that review and think, is that deliberate? Last week, you could go on eBay and you could bid for the manuscript, Jim Ward's manuscript of deities and demigods how much do you think that was going for does it come with a free trash can 
<laughs> it doesn't come from a tree. It does not come from a tree. Has it, has it got sort of marks where it's been thrown in a trash can where it belongs? Yeah, there's, I there's, would say, let, let's, let's say £200. £200. The original manuscript, so this is the typewritten mm, manuscript. Yeah, I suppose that might be. A thousand. A thousand. You, a thousand. You pay about a thousand. No, I, whoa, 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 no, I wouldn't pay. Th- I wouldn't pay. You didn't say that, did you? You said, what do you think it would go for? You didn't say what I'd pay for it. Because you know what I'd pay for it? Nothing. I wouldn't bother. <laughs> but <laughs> Shall I, tell you how I much wouldn't it... pay it. Go on. Go Shall on. I tell you how much it was up for? And it is now... <laughs> No longer available, which indicates that a bid was received and it, it, it went. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Twelve thousand dollars. I bet his guard he took it out of the trash can. I'll have to end now. I'm in shock. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Are you looking for a D and D podcast with a dark side? Something more like Game of Thrones and less like Monty Python? Tale of the Manticore is part dark fantasy audio drama, part solo D&D RPG. There's no plot armor here. The dice make all the important decisions. Join me as I resurrect the excitement, wonder, and emotion of old school D&D. Made for a mature audience, Tale of the Manticore is both a fiction and a game. It's the story where chaos rolls. Pause bag! As I said, I've been listening to episode two which was the first that we did about Call of Cthulhu. Listening to it again reminded me that one of the features of the second part of the two-part episodes was the postbag, reviewing some of the listener feedback that we've received about the topic under discussion. Following the first part of this episode, we've had lots of feedback saying how great Lynn was as a guest and how some people have already started their journey across the Silk Roads in the Children of Fear or how people were getting ready to play it themselves. However, it was the idea that in space no one is surprised by Cthulhu that attracted the most comment. We talked about some of the settings that we'd experienced and suggested that it was far future space that's the least satisfactory in our view, because seeing aliens in space is to be expected. What's exciting and threatening about that? Also, it was hard to do something convincing without defaulting to the familiar H.R. Geiger tropes. Over on the Discord channel, it provoked some debate. Rob Archangeli made the good suggestion. Colour out of space. In space, an unknowable phenomena gets on board the ship stroke station, mutating and decaying all around until it's either removed or the investigators manage to avoid it and escape. Ludovic Chaban one of the hosts of the rebranded Windwords podcast. It's now known as the God Learners podcast with RuneQuest flavoured content, gave a longer response that I found intriguing and helped me to think differently about the far future as a potential setting for Call of Cthulhu. He said, First, there's a difference between a Lovecraftian game in space and Call of Cthulhu in space. Both are doable in my opinion, but we're talking about the latter now. To me, the core activity of a Call of Cthulhu game is an investigation to a mystery that turns out to be supernatural, pitching you against the cultists and things man wasn't supposed to know, TM. Call of Cthulhu adventures are often using the 1920s setting as a way to send investigators to the barely explored parts of the globe. And frankly, A space setting gives you tons of that, including the bits where you have small isolated communities doing weird things. Alternatively, other Call of Cthulhu adventures happen in transit or around travels, on boats or on famous continental train lines, for example. And space travel also gives you similar opportunities. In addition to that, I like the potential of exploring What happens when humanity pushes the limits of its territory and starts going against the mythos creatures? What happens to the Migor outpost on Pluton when we start sending probes there? My inclination is generally to keep it hard sci-fi and therefore mostly limit the space stuff to our own solar system, which suddenly becomes the new unexplored frontier that the 1920s were doing simply with Earth. But it could be fun to imagine a dark space opera where we can do faster than light travel 
and everything that that brings with it. I believe there's a way to handle this in a cosmic horror way by recognising that the Elder Gods were not big monsters who live around this or that solar system. I'm thinking there's something cool to be done by looking at what happens to a few people in Solaris or Event Horizon or Interstellar and such and imagining how they could apply to a whole generation ships and colonising efforts. Hmm, thanks for that Ludovic. The notion that the core activity of Call of Cthulhu is primarily investigation, exploration, rather than horror, is the feature of the Seth Skoskowski and John Hook's new podcast, Modern Mythos. I've never really considered it before. I have a very narrow view of what an investigation is. It makes me think of puzzles and procedurals and whodunits. By conflating investigation with exploration, I can see the opportunities for potential of Call of Cthulhu adventures set in space, and it makes it a bit more appealing. I'm going to run Valkyrie 9, Paul Bodowski's award-winning scenario for his Cthulhu hack for the One-Shot Club, which certainly owes more to Douglas Trumbull than Ridley Scott. And, thanks to Ludovic, I have a couple of ideas of my own too that are going to percolate and see if I can stick a Shoggoth in the final frontier. Oh, get me caught! And welcome back to the room of uh, role-playing rambling. This is the point at the end of every game where we stand with our courts on, staring at each other, starting to talk about stuff after a game. Yeah, it takes forever, edging towards the door and then coming back again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for another <laughs> thing, that Columbo, that Columbo moment where we... <laughs> finished the game and, and we've done what we came here to do but actually we quite we quite like a chat but somehow that doesn't seem right so we put our coats on to sort of say well we're, we're leaving now but we can still have a chat part of those chats are hoary old anecdotes mm. that we remember from our past and i thought we'd have a chat about um chat about a period of time in 1986 it was definitely 1986 and i remember this um period very fondly because I think most of my anecdotes from my teenage years are compressed within three weeks. And that's what strikes me as weird about this endeavour that we've done over the last few years. When I listen to First, Last and Everything from our contributors, our burnt contributors, they seem to be in playing over a longer period of time. They started earlier than us, they finished later than us, they played much more games than we did. And it made me realise that actually we played it for a very compressed period of time and we played very few games. Yeah, that that's true. We didn't we didn't play we didn't have any money. So we just didn't buy games because we just didn't buy I didn't have any money to buy them. We we only had money to buy the odd little supplement. I I bought traveller supplements because they were quite cheap, but but I couldn't afford an actual different game. You know, unless it was like you say, birthday, birthdays or Christmas kind of territory, wasn't it? To get a new game. And our peak playing period was between 1982 and 85. In my in my mind, we we played from 19 around 1981 82 until 1992. But in the late 80s and early 90s, it it became very sporadic and very infrequent, didn't it? Uh, I think one of the last games I remember before Deep Freeze was a game of Call of Cthulhu on General Election Night in 1992. And then we didn't play again till Kevin in 2004. So there was that 12 year, 12 year gap. But yeah, the, the kind of early to mid 80s was this compressed period of playing. We did, we played a lot, you know, as we've said before, we played like all day Saturday, all day Sunday. You know that kind of thing. Every and day, every day, yeah. every day, all the time. So there was a lot of it, but it was quite compressed. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and it was only only a few games compared to what what we do now on the podcast. When we look at all the games we've played over the course of a year, and I'm astonished at how many different types of game and system we've played compared to back in the day. We would have said, well, which systems have we played? We would have said, oh, well, uh, RuneQuest, Call of Cthulhu, Traveller. That's it. That yeah. would have been it, wouldn't it? Maybe a bit of Tunnels and Trolls, maybe a bit of Advanced D&D, but, but there would have been potential for a year to go by where we wouldn't have played those. We would have 
just yeah. played solid RuneQuest and solid Cthulhu and solid Traveller, and that was it. And they had yeah. a quirky game coming up, like uh, Merp or the Gamma World, where it was like a try it and see. Um, um, top seed yeah, game. that's that's it. We did, we did, yeah, we, yeah, we did play. We did play those games, but we didn't play them consistently, did we? No, we played a few games of Top Secret. We played a few games of Gamma World. So I was thinking kind of, of this this three week block, and obviously it's had more. It, it probably had more impact than on me than it did on you because you're only part of it. And you know, you know me, I'm a solipsistic uh, person who believes that you weren't doing anything on the days that you weren't with me because you know <laughs> i didn't have a life at that time that time the 80s kind of didn't <laughs> i think but i think at that time you were courting as my mum might say courting you know? how old are you <laughs> courting you know I mean? Dad? You were courting you were courting me was courting yeah, i was yeah. footloose and fancy free um yeah. And I, there was this uh, thing where my mum and dad had gone on holiday to Markham in a caravan with my sister. And they left me in the house for a week. And we had a riot that week, didn't we? We were in there every night. We were watching videos through the night. And there's a lot yeah. of stories around that that I could tell, but they're not particularly gaming stories. But I'll tell yeah. one about um, Simon. Simon, as you know, was like a grammar school lad and he, he thought he was more sophisticated than us. So we wanted to watch a mucky film. Do you remember this? Watch a mucky video. Yeah, I do remember. Oh, yeah, I could have forget, yeah. <laughs> we were trying to watch a, a mucky <laughs> film and we put Simon in charge of getting this mucky movie from the video store because <laughs> he... He affected the air of somebody. We couldn't, we couldn't put you in. We couldn't put you in charge of it, could we? Because if you'd gone down, it'd just given you the sword and the sorcerer again, wouldn't it? So we couldn't put you in charge. That's to be someone who wouldn't not be given the sword and the sorcerer again, which is what happened to you whenever you went to the video shop. We we'll watched that that week. Week, I'm pretty sure we did. And then when it came on, nothing happened, did it? It was like a. a, a it was just like a. A thing that might be on the telly in an, in an afternoon. It's the kind of thing your mum would watch. <laughs> kind of like Catherine Cookson or something, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 When's it going to start this? We were ready, weren't we? were getting all excited. And, yeah. <laughs> Horses and stuff. <laughs> anyway, that was that week. But during that week, um, something significant happened because I was, at the time, I was doing a YTS. And that week, I should have been at college, and I didn't go because I, I couldn't be bothered going. I, I had the house to myself and used it. So I got kicked off the course. And what that meant was I didn't get paid for that week. And I was depending on that money for the week after when we were going to Markham. My mum and dad were coming back, and we had the caravan to ourselves in Markham, and we had this plan of a gaming week, the two of us, in Markham, living the high life. However, I had no money. I had twenty pounds. That's all I had for the week. And uh, so we, we headed uh, to Markham. And I can't say that we we planned it particularly well. I can't remember taking many clothes or anything. We didn't take anything with us, did we? No, uh, we we didn't really. We didn't we didn't plan it particularly well. And I think we both had very little money. I might have even had less than you because I didn't have a job at all. So I think I had less money than you. And I, I think the way we survived was um, by staying up all night and sleeping all day. We became nocturnal because we realised that if, if you're up during the day, there was a temptation to go and spend money. But of course, if, if it was night and everything was shut, you didn't have to. That was our logic. Yeah. So we, we kind of turned into these kind of, nocturnal creatures in this caravan all night and slept all day yeah <laughs> and I, I remember um we'd done an all-nighter um the day before we went to uh, the caravan the what uh, because i think everybody come around to watch videos and i said oh i need to go into uh, town and bear in mind that i had no money i went to the music store and i bought a penny whistle for 2.99 do you remember that? Mm, money, well, money well spent. 
I was into really into Jethro Tull. And I thought, this is my way in. If I can learn how to play a penny whistle. And I said to you that <laughs> worst comes to worst over this uh, holiday, we'll go busking. I'll play my penny whistle and we'll get some, some money in. And, of course, I were crap at it. Did you get how to play the penny whistle by James Galway or something? Is it, it like it a was, book with it? Yeah, it came, like came with a book with James Galway on the front. I thought I'd be doing uh, songs from the wood within a week. <laughs> And I could barely do three blind bloody mice. And I three blind it, mice. <laughs> at, at one one stage, you know, you were giving me like passive aggressive looks in the caravan uh, as I was trying to learn how to play this and and our fortune. Um, but by the end yeah. of it, you were actually saying, "Just stop playing that." <laughs> yeah. Mind you, I, it's probably hard to be fair. It's hard to tell because I give everyone passive aggressive looks if you put me in the caravan. <laughs> Because I, I do have a hatred of car- I'm not a fan of caravans. I hate, I hate them. I hate them. I'm not built for them. I, I think size has something to do with it. I'm quite big. I have broken lamp light fittings with my head in caravans, you know. But, but I've had too many holidays in, in caravans. They, they're awful. They're just awful things. Awful, awful things. Going to the toilets like spectator sport, isn't it? Those paper thin walls. Awful. Just the whole thing's hassle. Like, why? You've got a house and you go on holiday to relax in a caravan where everything's hard work, isn't it? Yeah. Everything is hard work. So, you know, the, the kitchen is pokey, everything's pokey. We used to have friends who had a touring caravan. I remember we went to the house once and they, they said, oh, we've got a new caravan. I thought, yeah, you can see it on your drive. They took us in it and they showed us around it. and it, they were like really impressed by it, but it was awful. They did like show, they, they say things. People at caravans, they go, "Oh no, look at this! Right, look at this! If you take this out of here and you put that there, and then you move that, you pull that up there, and you spread this out, you put that leg down there, and you move that, and you shift that, and you flip that over, and you put this there, and you do that, and you do that, and you move that, and you put this peg in here, and do that. It's a bed, and you think." Oh, every night, every night I've got to do it. It'd be morning by the time I've done it. Oh, I'm tired. I'm tired. I've been walking on the beach all day. I'm tired. I, I, I go to bed. Oh, I've got to build a bed on the now. Yeah. Awful, 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 awful things. Well, I don't think we minded too much back then. But as I got older, I realised the real, real horror of a caravan. One of the things that we realised when we got there is... Um, over those uh, the, the week before and that week, I forgot that we had to make food um, for each other <laughs> or eat it. More uh, importantly, and, and eat it. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember just having a look because my mum and dad had left some stuff behind, and I said, "Don't worry, with all these material, we can make a scouse." And he said, "What's a scouse? It doesn't matter what we put in it; we'll put it all in." So we had a big pan, didn't we? And we put corned beef in it, beans, the full lots, everything I could find in it. It was like your mum and dad had played a practical joke on us <laughs> and left <laughs> random ingredients in. They were ahead of the time. It was like ready, steady, cook. But, you know, practical joke. Let's leave them a load of random things that will do not go together because surely they won't stick them all together, will they? Oh, yeah. Oh, we will. Oh, we will. We will. And I oh, think we, I remember we, we, you being shocked that I put mint sauce in it, some mint sauce. And I said, no, I'll give it an extra flavour and put it in the salad that I had. And uh, You put mint sauce on salad and I was, um, I, yeah. You know, it probably fun. worked. To be fair, it probably works. I think it did work. I'll give you that. It wasn't because you knew what you were doing. It was because all you had was mint sauce. Well, the, trouble was, <laughs> the trouble was with this uh, skate pan, it was massive. And the idea was that we could eat it all week, but clearly we couldn't because it was started growing like fur on it, didn't it, after this? Clearly we couldn't because it was horrible. <laughs> that was another factor, wasn't it? It wasn't just it wasn't just the food safety element of keeping this thing for a week. It was, and it was developing a, a life of its own. It was like something out of Cthulhu in the fridge, this scouse thing. <laughs> but... It was the fact it wasn't that nice, was it? But the thing, the thing is, is that we had to clean that pan, and to clean the pan, 
as, as anything, if you want to do anything in a caravan site, it means that you have to have a chat. I mean, you have a stop and chat with people. Oh, yeah, you don't that's know. the other thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's the other thing with them, isn't it? Everybody Cheer, has this beep, beep. general bonhomie about them, haven't they? With yeah. yeah. The cups in the man. All I want to do is wash a cup. I don't want to talk to you about my journey here. And yeah. so as young kids, we just could not face the washroom, could we, to clean the, the, this pan? Well, I can't but, face it now, can I? <laughs> I can't face it now. I hate it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You go to caravan sites and you walk into the washroom and yeah, chirpy people. Morning, morning. <laughs> Get lost. Get lost. Leave me alone. <laughs> Bothering me. <laughs> anyway, go on. Yeah. You've got such a nerve with caravans. You know, and you know you have. You know you have. Yeah. Everything. Everything has to be done with a degree of like you know, joie de vie and. Uh, all I want to do is go to the toilet. Yeah, like, yeah. You go, you go in the washroom, and there's someone there having a shave, with his shirt off, singing sea shanties or something. <laughs> and you think, do you do this at home? You don't do this at home. Stop doing yeah. it here. But yeah, so this pan, it did develop a life of its own, didn't it? It was. <laughs> the way- yeah, stick. You say you say stick a shog off on it. There's one in that pan. I think it did develop eyeballs, didn't it? And bubbles and pops yeah. and stuff in there. <laughs> in there. But the idea was, was that it was going to be a gaming week. Mm. But it didn't really ha- happen, did it? We, what would happen is that, as you say, we'd be nocturnal. And um, we'd end up watching, I, th- I remember watching uh, Murder at the Rue Morgue and um, mm. the Edgar Allan Poe. Because I had this, uh, this scenario that was based on a theatre of blood mm. um that i never we i never got around to doing it because we'd end up wouldn't we we'd end up uh, drinking and then talking and then i think you know in our lack of organization we only had one tape and it was of um, selling england by the pound and you had taped it on something that one of your mum's christmas tapes and so yeah. you get to the end of it and uh, johnny mathis had started when a child, you got half a Johnny Mathis when a child was born. And the more vodka you drink, the funnier that song is. <laughs> Guarantee you. If you, you drink a lot of vodka and listen to that song, you not stop laughing. I don't know why, but <laughs> funny. But one of the most um, Cthulhu esque or most uh, horrible things, as well as that pan that was slowly shifting around the uh, the kitchen, we went to the uh, waxworks. Now, the waxworks in Morecambe. Had seen better days, like most things in Morecambe in the eighties. Had seen better days, aren't they? It, it was like stepping back in time. It still made it, it, it like this was the mid eighties, but it still made a high profile of um, Billy Connolly in uh, his banana boots. That was the most... banana the banana boots. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was the top celebrity, wasn't he? And the place had like a. A very specific smell, and when I smell it, I like to say that it's like a smell of formaldehyde, but I'm sure it's not. Yeah, I know what you mean. It was a kind of creepy place where, yeah, it was like something out of a horror film. There was a peculiar smell about it. It wasn't wax. And it wasn't very popular. So whenever you went in, you could guarantee that you were the only people mm. in there sharing the space with these, you know, Lord Mountbatten with his uh, glossy eyes. Following you around the room. <laughs> or people, it is so badly done. If it wasn't for the name card, you'd wonder who it was. Just no idea <laughs> yeah. who it was. The name card was missing. Do they use that? I don't know who yeah. that is. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, who had a finger missing. <laughs> Someone's nicked Jimmy Carter's finger. What's happened to it? Where is it? Send it back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nick Jimmy Carter's finger. Watch me. <laughs> <laughs> well, also in there, also in there, we went in this, didn't we? There was a place like... Then like the Chamber of Horrors and all that. But they had a place that was forbidden. You weren't allowed to go in unless you were an adult. We were adults. We were adults. Yeah. To some extent. We went up to it and it had a warnings about it. And we said, how bad can this be? It turns out that it was really bad, weren't it? It was very, very unpleasant. How would you describe it, Blythe? It was like... A, Tableaus, weren't it? Medical tableaus. Death masks, I suppose. Like it was like him 
I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how you describe it. Yeah, medical kind of sort of medical waxworks, but not. But they weren't the white part of the waxworks. They were things that I don't know. Doctors in days of yore must have used to to show as examples of various horrible conditions that people had. That's the best yeah. way I can describe it. He wasn't really like the waxworks at all. It was just like some I don't know museum of medical horror. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was just like, why would you want to see it? I'm on holiday in uh, Markham. What I'd really like to see is the effects of syphilis on the uh, yeah, the yeah it's really, really strange, wasn't it? Really strange thing. Yeah, it's bad enough that I'm in a caravan. I don't want to see this as well. <laughs> the first Overactive part. imaginations. He's got he's got a theatre of blood in a, in a bag there, ready to run. I've been watching Murder in the Room Mark and looking at horrible medical things in a waxwork. <laughs> And, and it, it, what it goes to show, I think, that week is, at the time, you had all that hysteria about role-playing games. And we, we never ran, you never ran that game of Cthulhu. But if you had, it would have been less horrific than anything else that happened on that holiday. And less emotionally scarring, wouldn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. All those, pe- all those people worrying. They would, those kind of people, with the, with the uh, you know, the satanic panic, if you just said we're going to make a pan of scouse, they wouldn't have worried about that, would they? But really, that's what you should worry about. Uh, and uh, to round it off, um, when I returned from Markham, I went to uh, Keswick for a week, uh, working in the theatre there, and that was a great experience. And then when I got back, I went with Simon to see Marillion at uh, Milton Keynes Bowl, uh, mm. the garden party. So like I say, over those, really, that was that, Three, four short weeks. Most of my anecdotes from my um, my teenage years are packed into that space. And yeah. now, you know, every day seems like the same. I often find myself thinking about that pan of scouse. Well, maybe you should should make another pan of it. Try and remember what you put in and re- try and recreate it. Which don't invite me around. I know you can't <laughs> at the moment, but when you can, don't invite me around. Try it on your own. <laughs> all right bye cheers goodbye i didn't want to bang on about it in front of blithy as he didn't go to the garden party in milton Keynes, a day-long rock festival close to the hearts of many members of the grog squad i went with simon on a bus trip organized by bolton hmv people forget that misplaced childhood was the number one album for marillion and they've been touring it around europe for a year before it came to this great headline gig. They were supported by Gary Moore from Thin Lizzy, who had bottles thrown at him. Jethro Tull, who was sublime, playing Fly By Night, one of my favourites, and Magnum and the Mamas Boys. One of my abiding memories was meeting the fans attending the Wham! Farewell concert at Watford Gap Service Station. It was taking place at Wembley Stadium on the same day, and they were dressed in white t-shirts and straw hats, while we were in black t-shirts, covered in lager, thrown at the concert. At least I think it was lager. Ah, an amazing three weeks of my life. Part John Hughes, part carry on camping with a smidgen of Brookside and a bit of Spinal Tap. Thanks to Lynn Hardy for being a great guest. The book club this month is reading the first volume of The Rivers of London. So if you'd like to join us on the first Sunday of the month, then please get in touch via Twitter at The Grognard File or over on the website, thegrognardfiles.com. Since I mentioned it last time that there hasn't been many reviews for the podcast for a while, it's been great to see that more people have taken the time to like, subscribe and mention it to other people. There's also been some more reviews too, so thank you. It really does make a difference. Thanks to the Patreons past and present for making it possible. The big hosting cost of the year has just come up and it's been paid. And all the contributions are invested into the podcast and into side projects. And we have some new patrons that come over the last few months that we want to thank this time. So at the fancy poof level, we have Adrian Game Nerd. Sam Hoda, not seen him since he was a duck in my game at the first grog meet. David Buswell Wibble, Lee Staines, Ed Foster, Darren Flood, 
Dr. Mitch, Tom Martin, James Morton and Rory Starks. Thank you to you all. For people at the so far so good level of the armchair adventurers and above, I like to give them a virtual gift. This time, I'm going to give them a spell from the Grand Grimoire of Cthulhu Mythos Magic, which was a belated birthday present to me from Blythe. Thanks, Blythe. I don't think this counts as re-gifting it, does it? The book is a very useful compendium of spells that have appeared in published Cold Cthulhu material over the years, and there's a couple of supporting chapters about magic with the spell list. I love a good spell list. Steve Valor Dulid gets Awaken the Inner Light. Stephen Lee, Cast Out the Devil. Alistair Smith, Cloud Memory. Ralph Lovegrove of the Fictoplasm podcast. I've appeared on it recently, talking about Hawkmoon and Quorum. You'll find his channel over on the Grognard Files Discord for a related chat. And he gets Crystal Call. Abs gets Enchant Whistle. I could have done with that myself. Simon Grace, he gets Catarain's Heat Wave. Scott Reinhardt, Keenness of Two Alike. Matthew Bailey, Paws of the Bear. At the next level, High Back Chair, we've got Gordon Cooper with Poison Blood. Peter W., who has very kindly donated some great Sky Realms of Jeroen and Tecumel material to the Great Library of RPGs, and you'll hear more about that in a later episode. So thanks, Peter. You get the powder of Ibn Ghazi. And Nick Edwards gets Quicken, the voice of the deep. At the very top level of the Armchair Adventures Club, where you get a little contour rug, you know, like one of those that you get round, round toilets in posh people's houses. And we've got Max. He's got soul singing. Jem Gilbert gets swelling torment. And Nigel Holloway, Great to see you back, Nigel. He gets Wandering Soul. Thanks to everyone. Thank you to everyone who's a patron and has invested in the future of the Grognard Files. We'll be back next month with another file from the Great Library of RPGs. Until then, adios, amigos. Okay, a bit of uh, James Mason practice. <clears throat> when I do count the clock that tells the time. When I do count the clock that tells the time. Oh, it, needs, it needs more work. It needs more work. <laughs>